afternoon. I, in some respects, I think feel as if the conference proper really uh, hasn't been kicked off yet since we haven't had any uh, of our breakout sessions. We've been doing sort of uh, plenary preliminary. So this will be the last plenary preliminary. And uh, after which then we'll move into a breakout session this afternoon. And then just remind everybody that at 4 o'clock we've got a field trip to uh, Innova, the Institute of Visual Arts here uh, for really uh, interesting exhibit talk. and. Uh, I think some hands-on work, so uh, definitely uh, encourage you to take advantage of that, hop on the bus, and uh, it's not very far, head down to it. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome my uh, colleague, Meg Newton, who will introduce Daryl Walton. Right. Okay. I, I want to see <laughs> Ani, Mogamit and Nikas, I'm Meg Noden, and I teach both uh, in the American Indian Studies program in LNS and in the English department. Uh, and I'm also the director of the Electa Quinney Institute on campus, which is an institute focused on American Indian education and works on partnerships related to language and cultural goals, and we think a lot about extinction and revitalization and life and where we find it. So I'm particularly pleased to introduce Daryl Baldwin, who is many things I could say. I thought, well, I could write a big formal introduction of how many books he's made. I, he was handing them out this morning to educators in the community, things in Miami, things in English. I have met many people across the nation who have respected him for years. We had earlier with us um, his son, who is in his 20s now, who perhaps his children and the language that he now surrounds himself with and brings to the Miami people are the best uh, recommendation for his work. Uh, so he is director of the Miami Center at the University of Miami, Ohio. I say that now in our way. <laughs> and also works with the nation. So he's combining the academic world and the community, the indigenous community perspective. So because we are of a similar age and we lived through the American Indian movement, and I have learned that one of the things that you do is you welcome people with song. And I know that Richard won't pull the hook really quickly. It's just a few minutes. I would like to sing what is known to us as the American Indian movement anthem, in a sense. I would say first going to Anishinaabe, Koyok, Wampisam. And it's a song that when I was a kid, we learned it only in vocables. We had no words for it. And one of the things we did when we were revitalizing our language was put it in our language because the language he works with is an Algonquin language. There are 26 Algonquin languages. I'm sure maybe a few words or syllables will sound similar to him. So all of our songs um, go four times around. So feel free, anyone who wants to join in, that's always a welcome thing.
My name is Daryl. It's a real honor for me to be here. I uh, visited campus for the first time uh, back in 2011. And uh, so it's been a few years uh, since I've been here. I always enjoy my visits to, to Milwaukee. Um, first of all, I guess I'd like to thank the organizing committee for allowing me the opportunity to participate. I typically speak at language revitalization conferences, so the topic of after extinction was particularly challenging uh, for me, but uh, I thank you for that challenge. There are many English concepts that are not easily expressed uh, in our language. For instance, there is no word equivalent in our language to the phrase, be outside. If I want to kick my kids outside to play, I say, akingishi papalo, which literally translates as, go play in the field. We don't have a word for religion. If we want to express something comparable, we say, tepewe elamanangi, which means it's good to pray. But this phrase is specific to Christian prayers. We have no word for nature, wilderness, or history, and currently no easy way to describe these concepts. We refer to our language as miamiatawangi, which is not a noun, but a verb, literally meaning how the miamia people talk. Our language is not a thing. It's not a life form. It doesn't breathe, and therefore it cannot die. It is instead a verbal expression of our intergenerationally established thought patterns that represent for us today a viable epistemological knowledge system. But languages can cease to be spoken. And when that happens, it's a reflection of community change. Revitalizing a language, therefore, is also about community change. The Miamia language is a language that ceased to be spoken around the 1960s after the passing of the last speakers. For years, many credible individuals said the Miamia language was extinct. But fortunately, there exist nearly 270 years of written language documentation and a community who was ready to begin the long process of reclaiming their heritage language. This challenges the broad use of the term extinct when applying to languages that have lost their speakers. So from that perspective, this presentation is about Miamia language recovery after extinction. The presentation that I prepared today is intended to share some aspects of language revitalization in our community. A reconstruction effort that began in the late 1980s that eventually became a community-wide effort in the mid-1990s and, and has since created significant social change among the Miamia communities. I'm going to share our evolving philosophical understanding of this effort and what I believe to be important for this audience. My hope is that you will see this work as a process that rebuilds, reconnects, empowers, and in many cases, heals my tribal community from a recent past of loss and dispossession. And that's the only thing I'm going to read to you today. <laughs> Is the lighting okay? Could we turn the lights down a little bit? The blinds down a little bit. Well, I might need some help with that. Some historical context, I think, is an important place to jump off anyhow. So it's a place we call Miami Ongi, 
Miami-Ongi just simply means the place of the Miami. And I've not included um, state boundaries here, but I have included rivers <coughs> and the Miami are names for all of these rivers. And so if you look closely, you should recognize the bottom portion of that lake, is Lake Michigan. You've got the state of Illinois, Indiana, and western portion of Ohio, a little bit of southern Michigan and Wisconsin. Those were areas that were familiar, very familiar to us. I must also add that there are many other tribes that claim that area as a homeland. And so it's important to understand that we lived in a shared landscape. And so tribal groups uh, continually shared this landscape for many, many years. The center portion here is what we would call the heartland. So we don't think so much in terms of boundaries as much as there was a central place by which our summer villages uh, typically resided. And that's what the white dots represent. So in a historical uh, setting, um, Miamia villages were located along the upper Wabash River, stretching from what is now Fort Wayne uh, to Lafayette, Indiana. And there were some outlier places that also served as uh, temporary summer villages. Our people signed approximately 13 treaties. And in those 13 treaties, we were forced to give up large tracts of land. We didn't sign those treaties alone. We were forced into signing those with our relative tribes as well. And through the course of many years, we would eventually be pushed onto smaller and smaller tracts of land. In 1840, we were forced to sign what would become our removal uh, treaty, causing the tribe to be relocated. I would say that our ancestors signed that treaty with no intention of ever leaving. And through a process of trying to privatize uh, land, um, they wound up um, getting individual families exempt from that removal. And the treaty said that the tribe would remove in five years, uh, having given up its last uh, central reservation in Indiana, which was about 500,000 acres, in trade for a reservation in the unorganized territory west of the Mississippi. Uh, that land, too, was supposed to be 500,000 acres, but later surveys would reveal that it was closer to 300,000 acres. But regardless, um, by year six, the, the federal government realized that the Miamis weren't in any hurry to leave their beloved homeland, and so uh, through military force, uh, began to load them onto canal boats. There were three canal boats that were loaded at Peru. They went up to Fort Wayne, a couple more canal boats, and then they took the canal system, uh, the Miami Erie Canal System, down to what's now Cincinnati. From there, they were loaded onto steamships and began the long journey west, uh, stopping at Kansas Landing. This was before statehood, and then walked the last 50 miles down to their new reservation. Again, it wasn't just the Miami here. There were many tribes being uh, relocated at that time. Um, we left behind nearly half of our population who were able to uh, be exempt from that removal, and their descendants reside in Indiana today. By the 1970s, we were forced into a second relocation down to Indian Territory, and um, the, re the remainder of the population moved with the tribal entity to Indian Territory, which became than Oklahoma. It's important to understand that there was a tremendous amount of change created with that removal. Many of our stories, our lunar calendar system, our ecological knowledge uh, was very, very deeply tied to a place we'd been into for a long time. So simply going to live somewhere else uh, was not an easy transition. The Miami chiefs, after moving to the unorganized territory reported back, the change of country will necessitate the change of our habits, and if the age portion of our people cannot do so, it is at least incumbent on us to provide for the growing generation and to prepare this change by a prompt and well-conducted education of our youth. And what's really significant about that statement is that they understood that changes were happening, changes they didn't have any control over. And they also saw that education was an important component in dealing with that change. Um, so it was a very important concept that was established uh, early on. On the topic of origin and religion, Miami leaders, both in the 1700s and in the middle 1800s, commented, and Mishikanakwa was, at this time, uh, 
in Washington, D.C., uh, <coughs> speaking with Konstantin Volny, or I guess it would be Philadelphia at that time, wouldn't it? Um, it is only difficult to find out how any particular nation sprung up at the beginning, but that, he answered, is as great a difficulty to the black coats, the Jesuits, as to us. And Mechiqueleta in 1824 on the topic of religion, there may be such things as a great spirit and a bad spirit, and they may not be. You are not certain of either, nor am I. And these are very significant um, comments because it speaks to the fact that embedded within our culture is a degree of agnosticism. We don't know everything. We never claim to know everything. And because of that, there was still a lot of learning to do and our people were not afraid to make change, to learn, and to incorporate those changes as needed. For much of the 19th and 20th century, we continued to exist, both in our homeland, but also anywhere in the country, under the cloud of this notion that our end was near, that somehow we, the generation of any given time, was to be the last generation. And so John Dillon, a known historian in Indiana, made the comment after our 1840 removal treaty, thus shrouded in darkness with the lights of civilization and religion beaming around them, the last fragments of one of the most powerful aboriginal nations of North America, eh, probably not, are passing away from the earth forever. The arms of the Miamis are now powerless. And even books like such my boyhood among the last Miami Indians. So this notion of, of the fact that we are relegated to the past has not only has its roots even before this time, but actually all the way up until, in some cases, the present time, we continue to be presented in public school history class as a people of the past, not a living people with the past. And that's hugely problematic, especially when our own youth are in those classrooms. So. This notion of death, extinction, dying, have been embedded within uh, a deeper American um, perception of indigenous people, not just the Miami, for a long time. So we've had that heavy cloud that we've had to try to function within. The after effects of removal, leaving people behind, both in Indiana, both in Kansas, a fragmented people in Oklahoma, the um, Depression era, forcing people to leave the tribal community to find work, a tremendous amount of change occurred. Some of the more significant ones was the loss of community land base. By the early uh, 1900s, the tribe was landless. It had no communal land. There were individual tribal members who owned allotments, but the, the tribe proper did not collectively own communal land. Loss of language speakers in many cultural practices. When a community gets blown up like that, it's pretty hard to maintain uh, certain communally based uh, activities. Community diaspora. Loss of economy. When we don't control our own economy and we're reliant heavily on either federal programs or whatever we could scrounge up through selling eggs or chickens or whatever. Uh, it was that the elders used to do in the early 1900s to gain enough money to go to Washington, D.C. and fight on behalf of the tribe. When you don't have that economy, you're very limited in what you can do in American society. So those are some important recognitions about our history. It should be no surprise then that our population centers today are around Miami, Oklahoma, northeast corner there, uh, eastern part of Kansas, and also back in the homeland, Fort Wayne and uh, around Huntington, Indiana. With that said, we have tribal members that live in almost every state and even some abroad. So um, in terms of community programming, language and cultural revitalization, this is the um, contemporary landscape that we have to work within. Very, very challenging. In Oklahoma, Clear up in the corner, there's about nine small tribes. Some of those are relative tribes like the Eastern Shawnee and the Peoria and the 
Seneca Cayuga and the Ottawa and the Wyandotte that we have historical ties to that were also relocated. But you can see that Oklahoma is primarily Indian country. There's about 39 tribes there coming from many different language and, and cultural groups. So that, there's a constant mixing that happens uh, within Oklahoma that has also been challenging in the context of language and cultural revitalization. So when we began our work, it was very, very significant that we tried to find what were the common threads, what were the core things that tie us together in a contemporary setting as Miamia people, because those core threads would be what we would eventually develop our programs around. We found that our kinship ties were still very strong. Miamia people know who Miamia people are, no matter where they live, for the most part. And so those kinship ties have, have maintained and, and been strengthened over time. We're a tribe that retained our right of self-governance. We are a sovereign dependent nation and um, recognized by the federal government and that sovereignty is very, very important uh, for us today and we have to defend it uh, pretty strongly. So our leadership structure uh, has evolved with us. Our language, our language is unique to us. One of 26 Algonquian languages, very large language family. Our habits, customs, and cultures. Even though these, some of these things have been damaged, uh, they're still there. In some cases they're remembered, in other cases they have to be revitalized. And our shared history. So for Miamia people, we share a part of our history together that I just briefly described to you. These become the core threads by which uh, our developing educational efforts uh, evolve around. I would propose to you that there exists today a global knowledge system. A global knowledge system that is primarily made up of science and research. No single nation can claim to own science and research, but many, many, many nations contribute uh, to the growing knowledge within this paradigm. Religion has become very globalized. Our own people now make up, uh, on various levels, are connected to many different world religions today. Economics. Native tribes, because of their sovereign status, are impacted not only by federal, but uh, uh, economies abroad. And politics. We can't get away from the fact that the world is very political in nature. And so as Miamia people, we participate in all of these things. These are part of our world today. And this global knowledge system, I would say, also has a knowledge system which we call Miamia ne Pauyone, and that is a Miamia knowledge system. So we think in terms of knowledge systems when we look at language and culture revitalization. Our unique knowledge system is based on a belief system. Some of that has changed over time, but some of that is still intact. Stories, ala sukani, is our winter stories that have certain kinds of messages and teachings within them. Akchimune is more of a historical narrative, so being able to retell his and reaccount uh, historical uh, events. So through stories, we share knowledge, we share information, and we pass that on. How we know the land. This is really an ecological perspective. So first and foremost, we're an ecologically based people, and that continually uh, emerges in the language record. Our ancestors had a in-depth knowledge of the environment. Mejimena Kosingi, habits, customs, uh, some of the other things that I had mentioned earlier. So these make up the core of what preserves that Miamia knowledge system. I would argue that around the world there are many knowledge systems. And at least in the context of our teaching, uh, we don't teach um, walking in two worlds, living in two worlds, we live in one world, we are one individual, and our ability to navigate the world is hinged more on our ability, our multicultural and multilingual skills. 
And so we teach from that paradigm. There is no us and them. There is different knowledge systems because the reality is, is that our youth connect to many different knowledge systems. And it's okay to connect to those knowledge systems. There is no us and them. There is only the knowledge that you have for whatever knowledge system you connect to. From an educational philosophy, we have some very core values that we draw from. We use the traditional lodge. <coughs> Many of you may be more familiar with the term uh, wikiup or uh, wigwam. In our language, we say wikiami. And that dome-shaped lodge, a traditional lodge, has come to represent today that place of nurturing, that place of shelter, and also that place of education, because there was a lot of learning that took place uh, within the lodge. That from our work has emerged um, some central themes. There's aqua pawak yangwe, which is to dream. And interestingly enough, this was one of the things that the Jesuits tried to intervene early on. Uh, we find comments in the old Jesuit records, if we could just get these savages to stop dreaming, we could convert them. And I think that says something about our ability to be creative and to seek out other forms of knowing. Akoke Lindi Yangwe is to care for each other. We have an obligation and responsibility to look out for each other. Nehwe Yangwe, to speak well. We try to teach our younger people to strive to speak well. Nepo Kayangwe, to continue learning, to be wise, to seek out knowledge. Ayok Kwamisi Yangwe, you have to strive to achieve. There is nothing for free. Pekanal Kosi Yangwe, to be kind. Ewain Yangwe, to maintain our kinship ties. And that last term isn't just internally. Our kinship system is used um, outside of our community oftentimes. So it's about building relationships more than it is an in-group sort of process. These are not values that we overtly teach as much as are embedded in the programs that we develop. So we make sure that there's these elements uh, as we begin to develop curriculum, programs, those sorts of things. At the community level, which we began in uh, mid-1990s, right around 1995, 96, we really began to work at building programs that connected, reconnected youth to this knowledge system through the, using the language as the medium. And so one of our, uh, I think, more uh, developed programs is the Awan Zapata Summer Youth Experience. Awan Zapata uh, in our language means sunrise. And it's intended to depict the younger generation that is re-emerging out of the rubble of our history and reshaping and beginning to, to help the nation heal. We have a program in Miami, Oklahoma, started in 2005, and more recently we've started a program in Indiana. We have about 500 tribal members in Indiana. The total population of the tribe is about 4,800, and uh, I'd say probably a quarter of that population exists in those three places of Kansas, Indiana, and Oklahoma. The rest are scattered from there. We're also beginning to do outreach because of that diaspora situation that we have, being able to take programming and educational opportunities outside of Oklahoma to where there are small populations of Miamia people uh, is a very, rather new development for us. Some of our younger people, and this is my son Jared, uh, who was uh, mentioned earlier, um, has taken that role on as a young person. He recently graduated with a degree in linguistic anthropology, he's got a strong interest in uh, a strong ability for a second language acquisition. And so he's really motivated to go out and try to reconnect with the, the, the younger kids. These are some of the places that we hold uh, annual or sometimes monthly programs. Another important place for learning is really in the home. This is where it really happens most naturally. And so much of the materials that we develop um, are self-directed, they're intended to be self-directed for families that are interested in engaging uh, in the home with language and cultural revitalization. I would say that the home, at least in my experience, having raised my kids in the language, uh, was the most productive. Uh, I've not seen anything more productive than when a child is born into a family that speaks to them as soon as they're born, if not before they're born. Uh, in the language. This is a clip, you know, unfortunately when I was 
engaged, my wife and I, engaged with our family at home, we never imagined that we'd be where we are today. So unfortunately, I didn't record a lot of what was happening uh, in our home until much later. But this is a, a, a recording of my daughter at the time reading to her baby sister um, a little language book that she had created. So this is what it sounds like for a Miamia child to be speaking Miamia as her first language. And that wasn't supposed to happen. The infant in that picture turned 18 last month. <laughs> We're, um, we're very, 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 very fortunate as a tribal community to have the kind of relationship we have with the university that bears our name, Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Back in the 1970s, tribal leaders began to slowly develop a relationship with the institution. In 1991, Miami University offered um, scholarships to any Miami tribe member that would want to come to Miami University. And so in 1991, there were three students that came under what's now known as the Miami Indian Heritage Award. And there was always a small number of students that, um, that came. I came to the university in 2001, and of course we'd already been engaged with language and cultural revitalization at the community level, so the population of tribe students began to, to slowly inch up. As of today, we have 25 tribal students at Miami University under the Heritage Award, which is a, a, quite an opportunity to be able to work with, in some cases, um, college-aged youth that, for the first time, have had an opportunity to connect with their heritage, and also, in some cases, uh, young people who have grown up through our youth programs who decided they wanted to come to Miami University. And one of the reasons that they come there is not just because of the scholarship, but also it's a chance for them to connect with the Miami Center. And so tribe students are required to take a series of courses their entire time there over and above their regular coursework. And it's just one credit courses uh, each semester. They take two semesters of Miami uh, language grammar and culture, two semesters of ecological perspectives and history, and then two semesters of modern issues like tribal sovereignty, self-determination, any modern issues that we might want to deal with at that time. And it's intended to give them a, a real rounded um, connection back to their tribal community. And it's also a place for them to bond. And, and that has probably proven to be uh, one of the, the biggest things. This is our current uh, uh, tribal students that are there. They do come from all over. We get several from Indiana. And this is our current Chief Langford with uh, President Hodge. Um, I would say that up at the upper tier at the university level, the relationship is incredibly strong. Um, President Hodge and Chief Langford can pick up the phone and call each other if there's questions, if there's needs. Uh, it's just an incredible uh, relationship that we've built there, and we're very fortunate for it. So what is the Miamia Center? Well, the Miamia Center is really the research arm of the Miami Tribe's Cultural Resource Office, especially as it pertains to language and cultural development. We're there to try to pull together the resources, do the necessary research, develop the curriculum, look at things like teacher training, uh, program development, and assist the tribe in making that happen. So we're really a multifaceted uh, center. What's nice is that being in a campus, uh, we have access to a tremendous amount of resources. Uh, a lot of interdisciplinary work uh, happens. We may be working with an environmental issue, doing language research, and working with computer sciences to develop whatever technological tools we may need to move forward. So it's a really interesting, um, interesting, um, I don't know, uh, way that this thing has organically evolved, because it wasn't certainly part of the plan in 2001. Of course, our goal is to graduate students, and we're, we're at a phase right now where we're really starting to look at the role of assessment in our work. We're really interested in 
how the role of language and culture in a youth's educational experience affects them, both in terms of identity formation, but also in terms of graduation levels. And that is hinged on the belief that if a child can step into a learning environment where their language and culture is valued, that they will succeed, that they will feel good about themselves, that they will feel motivated to, to be. And so we want to create that environment to, to the fullest extent. A little bit about the sashes. This is something we did a few years ago. Again, just a, a small identifier. So this is traditional ribbon work. Uh, the old traders used to uh, trade ribbons, silk ribbons, and our ancestors and other tribes did the same thing, uh, would create geometric or floral patterns out of the ribbons. So any, every graduate then gets um, a sash that has ribbon work on it. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. So this is my son, Jared. This is really the staff of the center or part of the staff. Uh, this is Bobby Burke, who serves as the tribe's liaison. She started in 1991. And has served in that capacity for a long time. This young lady here is one of our summer teachers now uh, for the A1 Zapata program. She's got a degree in, in uh, education. And this student here uh, is actually going into uh, educational administration at the graduate level. And we're hoping to continue work with her. And this student here um, is actually in the PhD program at the University of Iowa um, studying psychology. And what she's interested in is furthering our work in understanding identity formation and the role of language and culture. So, so it's interesting the students, as they come through this process, how that very much affects uh, what they choose to do in life, but then also how that contributes back to the tribal community. I think this is a, a nice example of the Miamia Nepoyone, the Miamia knowledge system, just simply the sharing of of plant knowledge uh, among tribe members, and also the role of science and how that plays into it. We have done some genetic work with our heirloom corn uh, for the purpose of preservation. And uh, so we had, a, again, a student that came through Miami University that was interested in genetics and asked, how can genetics help us? And so this was one area that we uh, supported him on. Again, ecologically based culture, just, just a tremendous amount of, of ecological knowledge. Uh, we're still learning a tremendous amount from the, the records. The older records are actually quite interesting because you can see, because our language records uh, span such a long period of time, you can see shifts in diet as the landscape begins to change. As the forests are cut down and the wetlands are drained, you can see where our ancestors' diets begin to change, moving more towards plants that are associated with disturbed areas. So this is, these are youth in the A1 Zapata program. Part of that program is to learn about, harvest, and prepare traditional foods. We've revitalized some of our games. So Makasine Mekindinge at the top. Uh, Makasin game, and again, you can see an application of ribbon work. Those are just little pads that are made. Of course, in the older times, they used moccasins. Um, today, some kids will just pull pot pad holders out of their kitchen drawers and, and play moccasin game, and that's okay. Uh, something that's really taken off, you know, I don't know what it is, but you put a lacrosse stick in a young person's hand and, and uh, a little bit of language and, and you can really get a lot of mileage out of that one. Um, so this has really developed, lacrosse has developed very, very nicely for us. Um, we currently, just in the last uh, three years, have been starting to do intertribal uh, lacrosse uh, games uh, with some of the tribes in Oklahoma that also have lacrosse in their history with their youth programs. We're hoping someday our Indiana population might be able to knock on the door of our elder relatives, the Pokagans, and have a lacrosse game someday. <laughs> <laughs> we were funded by a NASA grant several years ago to at least begin to look at the, at the notion of science. So if we were to try to teach science through the lens of Miamia language and culture, what would that look like? So we created a, a program called Earth and Sky. And it was really to look at the geology and, and also to look at the sky and to begin to, to talk about these things. We organized the curriculum. These three colors are based on age groups. And so this is part of what our teachers are producing. They're trained in education, and I think it's very, very valuable that um, people who understand child development and those sorts of things are part of this process. And so there is a geological component of that curriculum. We're going to continue to expand on this into the future as it's just it's a topic of interest for me as well. 
And of course, this produces an array of, of materials. You know, I, I would say that for some of the materials that are actually specifically designed for programs, they tend to be more um, effective in, in teaching and learning from. Sometimes we create things and they just go out into the community. And um, language prestige is something that we can't ignore. It's very, very important because remember that there are still adults, and in some cases elders, who grew up through that phase where our language was extinct. And we had to change that language ideology at the community level. Well, how do you do that? Um, it's not an easy task, but it's one that, that takes a lot of multi-pronged approaches at, at getting the, the tribal community as a whole to one, believe that our language isn't dead and it has a value and it needs to be invested in. And that took 20 years to begin to shift that, that ideology. So just because we print something and it doesn't necessarily revitalize the language, it can in fact do other things. And so we're, we try to pay attention to, uh, to the effectiveness of different kinds of materials in different generations. Probably one of the more important elements is um, developing educational models. I mean, I remember the first time I had the opportunity to, to walk into either a room or to have a group of Miamia people around that I wanted to teach something to, and it's like, well, we don't have a word for history. How do we even teach a concept like history? It's not that our ancestors didn't understand that there was a yesterday. How do we begin to teach that? And so these models don't exist out there for us. We had to figure out how to do that ourselves. So whether we're talking about relationship models, uh, models related to time, uh, history, whatever it may be, through our own process, we have to develop educational models. Because the reality is, is that for our ancestors, this was just life. But today, we have to be conscious about our language and culture. And if we're going to teach it, we're oftentimes going to have to teach it in non-traditional means. So we have to have the tools to be able to do that effectively. More recently, we begin to look at uh, child development and how the language reflects various levels of child development. So over here on the left, you have the different phases of development color-coded uh, by um, yellow being the youngest, uh, blue being a middle-aged, and red being more of an adult color. And then over on the right is that global knowledge system. There's been a lot of work over the years on child development. We can't ignore the fact that science has a lot to contribute to our basic knowledge of child development. But what we're really interested in is how these two things mirror up or match up, or where they're significantly different. Because that allows us then to teach, this is how Miamia knowledge system differs from the global knowledge system. One example would be that the marriable age among the Miamia people uh, historically was in their mid-20s. And the reason being is because they were not uh, developed enough in terms of the mental capacity to be able to support a family, that sometime in their middle to late 20s was a better time to marry. Technology. Technology will not save our language, but the thoughtful use of technology can help us. So we're, we look at technology, we use it. I'm interested in the role of social media. Uh, in a case like that, there's no reason for us to create something, but in the case of an uh, iPhone app, uh, maybe we have to create it. But again, if it's not part of an educational program, these tools tend not to get used, and, and we've certainly had our share of those. <coughs> and I'm gonna end this talk by leaving the question of, is the Miami language dead to the wisdom of a 12-year-old? So in 2007, we actually asked our young people, is the Miami language dead? And this was one of the comments we got. If Miami was a dead language, how would we be able to speak it? So I will leave it at that. Anyway, thank you. And I guess I'm allowed to take questions? Yeah. Thank you for your talk. And, and uh, I'm not a linguist, but I so, sort of pretend to be sometimes. And so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, so it is are words being added to the language because um, you're running up against concepts that didn't exist before and trying to develop these pedagogies around that? Right. Are you adding, making new words? Yeah, yeah. It, I would say that's probably a slow process at this point because we're still doing a tremendous amount of linguistic work of the uh, 
materials we have, we've only utilized 30%. So although we have a fair grasp of the grammar and we can do uh, basic inflections, we know we're going to learn more as we continue to process more of those materials. So we've got that issue. But aside from that, yes, especially with younger learners, they want to be able to say things that they do and, and have on a daily basis. So something like computer, we say, kinde lenda kani, which just means that thing that thinks fast. So there are opportunities when we actually engage the youth to help us in the creation of those terms. And what's really powerful about that is then they become part of the creative process in, in creating new terminology, which all languages do. So, yeah, but that's a slower process. We hope over time that'll ramp up a little more. Mm -hmm. Do you have any opposition within the Miami communities from Pentecostals, other evangelicals that uh, claim that the native language is the language of the devil or born a, a slightly different way that to speak the language is to be part of a pagan religion? Mm -hmm. um, I would say in the last 25 years I've only ran into that once. So that's not to say there isn't more out there. But I would say we're very, very careful. We don't teach in a way that says, in order to be Miyamiya, you have to believe this or you have to think this. Remember, the goal is to connect them to a knowledge system. But what they do with that as an individual is an individual choice. And so even when we compare the global knowledge system with our own knowledge system, that's not to say there isn't any conflict there. But any conflicts must be resolved on the individual level. We don't do that in a classroom. It, it allows for enough flexibility that people can step into that learning circle without feeling too much like they're being challenged. Mm -hmm. So the, the core of the material that you still haven't processed yet, roughly how much is, of it is religious? Like how many are Bibles and catechisms? Yeah. And, yeah and we have three <laughs> major documents that come out of the Jesuit era. and. Um, <clears throat> We have not processed all of those, although one is now um, transcribed and the French has been translated. They run about two to three hundred pages. Um, there is some religious text in there. What, what we tend to get, because the Jesuits were living in these in communities for very long periods of time, they were observing daily life. And so there's a lot of really uh, good daily life uh, language that comes out of that. But yes, I mean, it's kind of, we, we know the language well enough now where we can tell where the Jesuits are playing with our language in order to get across concepts like Immaculate Conception and Virgin Birth, which I'm sure our ancestors said, what are you talking, we know how things work. Yeah. Um, there's a notion abroad among uh, non-experts, just a lay person who's not involved in most of this. Um, that inherent in, um, in, let me call them aboriginal systems, are um, valuable knowledge, are valuable um, views of the world that we're losing with languages and with the cultures. When NASA funds a program such as um, the astronom astronomy or astrological program, um, when you have an ecological program, are you attempting to recover um, your notions of the sky or of the of um, nature at the same time that you're also trying to educate um, your your um, youth in the various um, global sciences and so mm -hmm. forth, or? Is there an attempt to redeem that on behalf of a broader culture than simply the Miami people? Yeah, it, it, what we try to do is we contextualize it in just simply the process of learning. That if you look through those lens, you see things a certain way. And if you look through this lens, you see things a certain way. And that living here in 2015, we're free to interpret that. We're not necessarily saying that you know, the way an ancestor thought about what thunder was a thousand years ago that we're teaching that. We know how thunder is created. And so there is advancement. But I would say that, especially ecologically, 
uh, when we began to do a lot of our ethnobotanical research, one of the interesting things was that there was a tremendous amount of plant knowledge, especially food plants. And I'm not talking about medicines, but food plants. And what we learned when we began to look at that is there's very little dietary information about things like milkweed in the spring when it's four leaves tall, because that's when we pick it. But man, we know that McDonald's hamburger inside out. And so what we learned is there's a huge vacuum in actual knowledge of what people had been eating and, and, and living on for a long period of time. So that's one area of ecological research we'd like to continue moving on to. Involving the youth, letting them realize that their indigenous knowledge system, which really is that lens that says, here are the plants that were used seasonally, this is how they were used, this is how they were prepared, that there's actually dietary information that isn't well known yet. And that's an, that's an area of, of study that they could, they could use. I think there's some interesting historical um, pieces as well. Um, you know, we have stories of underwater serpents and things like that. But we learn through time that those are actually connected to meteorological events as well. Um, meteorites, and we know that meteorites are part of human history. And it's very likely that our ancestors witnessed meteoric uh, events at times past and that those have been preserved um, in various ways through these stories. So it's not that a particular story is, is true or factual as much as it is a representation of our historical past. And so we can learn from that. And so it's really contextualizing the notion of, of learning. Another area is the notion of kinships. We have a very, very vast and depth notion of kinship. In other words, how we relate to each other, how we relate to humans outside of our group, and also the, the natural world, how we relate to that. And a lot of that's embedded within the language. And I would say that as we look at some of the environmental issues that we're dealing with today, we could use a real lesson in learning how to get along with the plant and animal life on this planet. So I think that those are areas that we can really begin to hone in on for our youth, that ecological perspective and uh, shaping that for them, that there is such a thing as a Miyamiya ecological perspective. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Mm -hmm. um, when Meg introduced you, um, she put her initial comments in the context of the American Indian Movement, and so there was like a political start to the to the thing. And I, I guess I've been wondering, in a way, I don't know if any of us have the uh, uh, should be arrogant enough to think that the things that we're thinking now will be around and relevant in a hundred years. But I'm wondering, in the particular context that you're working and, and trying to revitalize the language, whether you have discussions about the longevity of the work, and and is it is it about now, or or are you thinking in terms of a longer future? It's a, it, it is about what's relevant now, but learning from our past, but being careful of that past. We have to be careful of that past because there are things that happen to us that would be very scary to, to young people. So for instance, we don't talk about removal with young kids. Um, we don't talk about some of the atrocities that occurred in our community. We save that until they're older adults when they've had a chance, maybe through a younger experience, to learn that their culture and language is positive and that it's okay and that later on they'll know how to contextualize some of those historical events um, that happen. So we're very careful to separate those sorts of things out. I don't think we're so much, it's not like there's a carrot out there that we're latching for. I think what we're doing is we're drawing from what we feel to believe viable, stable, indigenous knowledge that we're trying to perpetuate forward. So it's more about what's moving us more than what we're latching for, if there's a metaphoric way to, to try to convey that. So it's constantly drawing on those threads of continuity and the strengths of those that are going to help us maintain ourselves as a group. And of course, language is the most viable way to, to articulate those things. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Daryl, I'm interested in the sort of diasporic nature of of your people, the fact that you have, you still have a homeland, but yet you have these tribes in Oklahoma, is how does that play itself out? Is there a, a kind of movement or impulse to for people to return home, or 
how, you know, how do those relations work? Tribal members tend to know that Indiana has a deeper history. They know that. And so their experience in coming home is, um, is powerful in that sense. They also consider Northeast Oklahoma to be Miami or, or home or Eastern Kansas. And so those are three places that the tribe, the nation proper, uh, has been. So we, we try to treat all of those as if they're all collectively home, but we all know that Indiana has the deeper history. There's also that notion of just creating Miami space, and that can happen in the home. And you know, in, in the context of language revitalization, we have uh, small workshops where we talk about um, language domains. You know, where can you create as a person language domain? Well, it's easy in my house because I don't have so much external, or in my car even for that matter, or my little work cubicle, cubicle at work. I mean, there are ways that, that we can idealize space that we can learn. <coughs> created as a Miamia space for language or whatever. So that gets in a way, it's, you know, in part, I guess, what I was thinking, which is so you have almost a kind of networked structure where it's not, home doesn't necessarily have to be dependent on a particular yes. place. I mean, I think about the Navajo for whom, mm -hmm. you know, there are these four uh, points of, not the compass, but these four places that, mm -hmm. that stand for a kind of homeland, and yet, it, I didn't hear, I mean, just curious, you know, much about land and, and particular place locales. And I don't know if that's just because, you know, you can't talk about everything, but I'm just, right. or if there's a kind of different model of, of what it means. For, for, for Miami people who live in Indiana, there are those places that are significant. And for those that were lucky enough to be born and raised there, there's a connection to those places. And I think that's maintained fairly well by just simply being there and knowing about that. For individuals that you know, were born and raised or maybe for two, three generations have been away, coming home is a very different experience for them. They may be told that something's significant, a particular place, they bend in the river, uh, whatever it may be, um, but it takes them some time and several visits and a growing connection to that knowledge system for them to develop a sense of, of importance for that. And that's, that's a different kind of process. So, but no place is very important. And, but the reality is we're also creating new places. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was curious, um, since you were starting out by talking about how like, the word for the language is not a noun, so it's not an object, so you think of the language differently through that, whether, especially when you're getting into some of the charts you were showing, whether the kind of grammar of the different words was changing the way you construct those charts and those relationships between concepts? I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> um, well, yeah, when, a couple of slides back when you had the, the charts that were like, these are different sort of scientific processes <coughs> and things like that. Yeah. Oh, that, this, next, this one? Whether the, the, the grammar of those, those words was feeding into how those charts were constructed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, and the context for, and, and the thing to realize is it's not just a translation, it's more about the context that a particular word lives in. So, you know, all I, in, in one particular sense, I, I said that a term, the Paul call, in, um, I think that was in this slide here. I think a good example that I like to, to draw on because it's easy to explain is this Nepoca here. That Nepoca, depending on where it lives, can mean to be conscious, to be wise, to teach or to learn. So it's a stem that actually has lots of ideas connected to it depending on how it gets used. And that's really the crux of what language does. It reorganizes things differently. It's not that concepts aren't there, it's just that they don't oftentimes get associated the same way that a, any other particular language might do that, like English. So one of the first things our language students have to learn is that you have to think differently in order to begin this process of learning Miamia. Now, if you're going from American English to, to another uh, Indo-European language, the leap may not be as great. But if you're going from American English to an Algonquian language, that, that leap can be much greater. So it tends to be more challenging. Does that answer? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk a little bit about the, the maybe circularity of the um, revitalization of language and the revitalization of culture? That is, do you find like teenagers or the college students pushing for certain kinds of cultural revitalization, such as bringing dreaming back as a motivating uh, uh, force? Yeah, I would say that um, an example that comes to mind, the, the students that enter into the programs, they're, they're kind of like infants. They can be kind of clumsy. <laughs> and they try really hard, and, and we have to give them encouragement and, and, and all of the nurturing that's needed. But nevertheless, there's kind of mistakes made along the way. So it may be that a child gets angry in a lacrosse game because he got smacked upside the head with a stick. How he responds can be an issue of culture. How a response gets dealt with can be an act of culture. So that's where um, just simple action and how it gets responded to, both in terms of language, in terms of who interacts with that youth and resolves that issue and helps that child understand that. It's a game. It's rough. It doesn't mean that the person hates you, that sort of thing. So, I mean, there's little things that happen along the way, whether it's misusing a kinship term um, that's intended to be for something else. Um, so there's a constant going back and forth between language and culture, language and culture, and experience in recontextualizing those things so that the individual begins over time to build their own interpretation of what this is. And then they then become a feeder into the larger effort of what this is going to shake out to be. Because the reality is, I don't control that, and neither does anybody else. But there are those threads of continuity we try to hang on, and there are ways in which we progress things to give them the best shot that they can to create something that's healthy, or what we deem is to be healthy. So. Mm -hmm. Um, this might be a little odd question, but uh, I taught at Miami University from 1977 to 1983, sure. long before probably ever anyone had ever imagined this, or at least planned this and put this together. Right. And so I'm coming from that experience, and my experience as someone who taught there but was not from Ohio, was in fact from Minnesota, was that people would say, Miami University, you mean it's in Florida because of that very large city down there, and that other university there, I mean, nobody knew where it was, and it, it seemed to have this very strange name. So it's kind of extraordinary to me to imagine this name that always seemed just alienated and odd to somehow get grounded in something, grounded in something that I, it doesn't seem to be in the history of the university so much as taking advantage of this name in this you know, kind of very productive, interesting way. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in how that works, how they, I mean, it, it, it seems just genius to have located an institute for the Miami language and people in Miami University, uh, which benefits the university, which, you know, which benefits this, as, as if uh, it had gone on since, you know, 18, whatever that were, 1807 or whatever the, the, the date that they founded that university is. So I'm, I'm just interested in what seemed like a, a really great idea, what seems like a really great idea of this kind of taking advantage of a name for visibility and then locating oneself in a university and making it happen. Clearly it's, I mean, from those smiles, it's a great advantage to the university because mm -hmm. it makes their name mean something more. Yeah, yeah, we both benefit from it. There's no doubt about it. but. What we're enjoying today has been the outcome of 40 years of relationship building. And I would say that that's hard and not, not many people are willing to do that. For whatever reason, the, the leadership at the time, whether it was past leadership or faculty that were there, were willing to invest in it. And so it was from that, and unfortunately you can't read it, there's actually a term, Nepondingi, that we use to represent that relationship. And it translates as learning from each other. So it has been a learning process for both the university as it has been for us. You know, it's an interesting thing. When I came there in 2001, um, when I was asked to be the director of the, it was then called the Miami Project, tribal leaders pulled me aside and they said, Daryl, you're not there to change the institution. <laughs> <laughs> and that may go against um, some, some rhetoric around, you know, uh, colonization and all of the other things. but 
what I found is that through reciprocity and through relationship building, we have changed the institution. It just wasn't over. It was very subtle and it was based and rooted in relationship. And I think because of that, there is a level of trust that now exists between the tribe and university that allows something like the Miami Center to flourish. Because we're not there to, to teach a bunch of classes. We're not there in tenure track. We could care less about that. We're really there to do the work of our community, but we've agreed to share that work in the classroom so that students that are there and come into contact with us, whether they're undergraduates or graduates, get to see real community work in progress and, and the difficulties around that work. So I think that that does, that does definitely benefit them and it benefits us as well. And of course you were there when the mascot was there, I'm sure. <laughs> right, and I was, so I was wondering about the, and I actually don't even remember the, the old team name, I forgot, except that I know that it- They were called Redskins. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. yep. So when, when did that stop, and when did that stop in terms of the history of the forming of this institution? When did they get rid of the name? I'm gonna, uh, you know, I, I'm going to not guess a date, but it was before I was there. But I will say that the Miami Tribe and Miami University struggled over that because the tribe didn't want to offend because they were more interested in the relationship than the mascot. <coughs> the university wanted to authenticate the mascot. Mm -hmm. Miami University or Miami Tribe tried to help them authenticate the mascot, but it didn't change what the fans do. And at some point, the tribe began to realize this isn't going to work and, and, and eventually passed resolutions saying we can no longer support the mascot. And that's when Miami University decided to drop it. There's been some residue of that over time, but I would say a lot of the students that come in now don't even know there was a mascot mm -hmm. redskin. So, you know, time has kind of healed that wound a little bit. Um, and we've moved on to other things. I would say that I probably would not have taken the position there had the mascot still been there. That would have been a very difficult decision for me because I, I don't want to work under the shadow of, of that redskin's name. So fortunately it's gone. And Miami University did a respectful thing by getting rid of it. Learn the back? Yeah, I was actually going to ask you, and it sounds like you don't know um, what the impetus was for that scholarship to get started initially. Um, but so then my other question was, it sounds like a large number of the tribe is located in Indiana. And Fort Wayne is a particular area, is that right? Yeah, that's a, that's a core center, yeah. So I was wondering if there are any sort of similar relationships in the Fort Wayne area as with Miami University. And then also, if what the effect is of having students come to Ohio, and I realize it's kind of just across the border from Indiana, but for the good or the bad or whatever, what that sort of process of going away to connect with these ideas is for students. That you yeah. Can well, the impetus for the uh, scholarship was to try to move away from the mascot. In other words, back when the mascot was going, uh, there were some key people that said, how can we engage with the tribe in a in a more positive way, and the scholarship came out of that. That was one. Um, in terms of students, a good chunk of the tribe students are coming from Indiana because it's close. It's only you know two and a half, maybe three hours, depending on where they live, um, to get to Oxford, Ohio. So the proximity has certainly uh, helped them a lot. And um, was there a third part in your question? Um, any universities or colleges? Oh, yeah. You know, the interesting thing is Miami University does not have a Native Studies program. That doesn't concern us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but what they have is they have this incredible relationship with a tribe. And because of that focus, maybe, we've been allowed to go to a depth that we might not have been able to get in under other circumstances. We have been approached by other universities and, and met with um, chancellors and presidents um, and talked about that. And it's very, very hard to reduplicate. And I think the reason it's hard to reduplicate is because you have to be committed to relationship building. And you've got to be willing to say, this may actually start to materialize 10, 15 years down the road. People kind of want a, tr a quick fix today, and it just doesn't work that way. So. All right, well, I think I'm done. And uh, well, Mission A, we thank you.